Welcome back to the channel. This is Anka Engineering and I'm Herman Wiegman. And today we're going to talk about the Jaguar V8 Electronically Controlled Differential, or the EDIF. What's it made of, why does it fail, and what we can do about it. Let's get into it. This is an E-diff, we can tell because of the electric motor driving a gear which engages the friction discs on this particular unit, so you can think of it as an electronically controlled uh, friction uh, LSD. This is found on the V8 Jaguars, mostly supercharged engines. you also notice that this particular unit does have the extra damper ring on the pinion yoke, unlike the V6S or regular models, which do not. Okay. We're going to take this unit apart. We did find that there was oil paste on the uh, drain plug. We have drained the oil from this unit. There's no fleck, but it is pretty dirty, and pretty, pretty black. But still oil, still functions. So I think this unit to be pretty good shape. Uh, this did come off of Jaguar XJ V8, I think 2016, 2017 model year. Uh, so that's interesting. So the, uh, a lot of different Jaguar V8 models carried this E-diff with the large uh, clutch pack over here. All right, we're going to take off the electric motor. Four of these uh, bolts here. It's a five millimeter hex. And there it is, with an eight spline shaft, very small diameter, but the motor is totally separate from the drive unit. No washers, no circlips. Oh, here's a rubber washer right there. So that stays with that unit. And that was just a bevel, bevel fit. Okay, one washer. I did want to take a moment to look at this 12 volt motor, uh, the motor that drives the gears and the gears that engage the clutch discs. This particular motor is nothing special. Um, I've seen that Land Rover variant of these as well. They have a locking differential, not necessarily a friction based one, but uh, it has a different connector with a circular connector rather than the square one as found here. The square connector has two main pins and eight minor pins. The two main pins go to the armature, and this I can feel it, it has some cogging. There are some magnets in here, so probably a, uh, like a wiper motor, uh, magnet uh, DC machine. Um, the other eight pins are probably position sensing and or direction sensing. Um, but this unit is nothing exceptional. The seal here looks nice, the o-ring looks nice, but back here the cover, there are some rivets holding the cover on, but the cover doesn't look very well sealed. Now there's probably a rubber o-ring on the interior, but this is just a stamped steel or a deep drawn cover. And I doubt the tolerances are there to keep a good water seal, so I'm suspecting that these guys, they can probably accumulate water, get damaged the brush assembly, and maybe seize. This one feels nice, but I don't trust it. It's not exactly aerospace quality. Here you can see there's a bearing cup, uh, and the brushes are probably in here. Okay, so 12 volt motor, possible source of failure modes. If we look here in this uh, gear cover, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, a cup for the shaft, and here the shaft is set in. A little bit of rust on that, a little disappointing, but otherwise, decent tolerances, probably pretty low probability of seizing. This one's in really nice shape, but never say never. So this gear could become a problem. I put a stub shaft in the vise, drop the differential unit on top of the stub shaft, the vise will keep the uh, unit from spinning and that will enable me to untorque these cover bolts. They're usually torqued to about 70 foot pounds, which is 70% of yield on these things. I 
also this feature, which is a cover or a cap of some kind. I wonder if that needs to come off before or after the cover. Inside the cover, nothing too special. This is the drain plug here, or a fill plug, with a whole bunch of garbage. Lovely, looks like friction material. This here is the temperature sensor. We can see that right here. And this is a pin. Maybe we did have to remove that first. On inspection of this unit, I can show you here there's a fair amount of garbage in the uh, seal area back behind this bearing race. And it's probably all friction material from the friction discs. This is as received. I'll have just taken off the cover and done an initial inspection. But here we can give just a quick test to the backlash. And you can see the backlash is being exercised between the pinion gear and the ring gear. Okay. When you're testing it with uh, the pinion gear, you often get movement of the gear set. But if you spin and toggle the carrier, the pinion doesn't often move. So you measure truly just the backlash. Okay. Uh, this one felt pretty good. I can try to measure that. It looks like we're getting about 10 mils of movement. So that's good. This is the carrier out of the electronically controlled differential. Uh, we can see the pinion uh, or the sun and planet gears down here, which is the differential action. And you see these uh, shafts going through. So the differential gears are buried in here. Uh, above here, we have a whole bunch of friction disks. And this must be then the motorized engagement of those friction disks. So we'll take this unit apart and uh, inspect the condition of those disks. Okay, so this is a mystery. How do we take the carrier unit apart? I think I have to take the ring gear off to separate the top hat from the main part of the carrier. But to get the ring gear off, I have to hold on to the unit and torque the bolts. But to hold on to the unit, I have to grab down here where the bearing is. So bearing off first, hold the unit, untorque the bolts, remove the ring gear, see what happens. Is remove the top hat screws and just lift this right off and inspect the top half. I don't think there's anything wrong with the bottom half, it's just differential gears. Um, so let's see what happens. What's inside the E-diff differential. And this here is what I'm calling the top hat. And I see some clutch plates in here and here are some other clutch plates. Look at that, that's a whole slew of them. That's a special one. That's a thick one. So if I just count them off, it's clutch and stationary disc with dog ears. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine sets. So it's approximately 18 discs here, 19 and 20. Now these are very similar in nature to the V6S model, which had the limited slip diff in the rear. The same sort of carbon fiber pads on a thin sheet of steel. Now these are in particularly good condition. The oil was in good condition. And so it looks like this unit still is in healthy uh, operating condition. Just to get a look at it, it's a weird three dog, three dog ears per side. And this is a multi-spline shaft in the middle here. All right. So I could see where these carbon fiber discs would break off, similar to the V6S model, because of the poor bonding method. And I could see where these discs would need to be re refreshed or changed. All right, well, let's keep these together and dig a little deeper. Now, just to dig around a little bit, there's quite a bit of crud. That's a lot of crud, a lot of friction material. These here are the pistons, probably, that the electrified motor runs a disc with a cam and that pushes those pistons up. 
which then essentially pushes this plate right into the friction discs to engage them. And that would then lock the rear axles together through this. There are two discs, interesting. One is very thin, it's probably a spacer disc. It mates to that friction surface. No, that's not a friction surface, that's perfect. That's stationary and this disc is stationary, it has dog ears. All right, so those would go flop on the other side of this pack. I think that's pretty straightforward. Not too bad to take apart. And there's a pretty obvious set of clutches that have to get replaced because one could see these failing. I'll inspect them one at a time and see what happens. I'm going to give you a nice close look so you can see. To reassemble this unit, it sounds like we just put the top hat upside down like this, load it full of the friction and stationary rings, and the final stationary ring on top then also gets the, the two spacer discs. And then we took the uh, axle gear out of the lower unit and make sure the oil rings are here the, on the unit. And we just make sure we can engage all the clutch discs. There we go. So this stack up is complete. And now let's see if this goes on. That's it. Put the two screws in. And that assembly is together. I'll take these dimensions, record them, and see if we can get a replacement for these. Let's stuff a Q-tip up there and see what we get. Ah, ah, a little bit of crud. There you go. Let's uh, see if we can go down from this side. Nothing. more crud. All right, it's quite plausible that um, the debris and the grime from the unit does end up in the vent pipe and that can clog. This unit was particularly good shape, relatively healthy from an XJL, maybe not abused, uh, and uh, this unit was pretty clean, but uh, there is evidence of grime accumulating in the vent. Let's talk about the heat generation in the E-diff. Um, this might not be obvious to everyone, but uh, we should think about what generates heat in the E-diff, and it really comes down to a friction force on the clutch discs and a speed difference between the axles. And we know that uh, the E-diff operates as an open diff normally, or as a locked diff if it's fully engaged. So, uh, just taking a peek at that, we know that an open diff runs relatively cool. It's just a bit of gear face friction, and um, uh, there's no real friction per se besides the gear faces. And a lock diff, there's no real gear face friction. It's just the pinion to crown gear friction. That's really it. And so those two states have relatively low heat generation. Uh, so the real issue is partial engagement. If the friction discs aren't quite open and the friction discs aren't quite locked, they're partially engaged. And that means that, that you have a speed difference on the axles and you have a fair amount of friction force. And so your heat generation is maximum when you're partially engaged. Kind of makes sense, right? So moving along, we can look at this and say, well, there's actually preload on the discs, so even if you try to be an open, you still have some preload on the friction discs. But they're only active when you're turning a corner or uh, you know, asking the car to spin the axles at different speeds. And so you can modify this diagram a bit. But basically, the dynamic stability control's job is to, to move the diff between open mode and locked mode. 
And how quickly does it transfer between those two states? Does it take a second, two seconds? And how much delay? Is it when you're on the throttle, when you back off the throttle? Um, does it take a second delay or half a second? Um, so if you're really truly driving the car, the F-Type or your Jaguar dynamically, how much time are you spending in that partial engagement zone? Um, how much time does the EDIF really have to, to, to transition between those two states? And that's where you're generating most of your heat. So I think aggressive driving is truly the cause of heat generation in the EDIF unit. If you're not driving aggressively, you're probably going to spend all your time in open diff mode. I'd like to talk about the E-differential failure modes. In the Jaguar forums, there's been a lot of uh, talk about how the vent pipe gets clogged and the seal breaks, uh, particularly on the pinion side, and it leaks oil out, and that leads to oil starvation and then eventually uh, physical damage uh, in the differential unit. Um, it's well covered, and I found evidence of that being plausible. Uh, I did find grind and crud in the vent pipe tube of my uh, the unit that I was looking at, which was an E-diff from a Jaguar XJ sedan. Um, but I also looked at the electric motor, and I found that uh, the electric motor could fail, either due to water ingress or a poor seal between the cover and the case of the motor, or for various other reasons, uh, it's a relatively low cost uh, permanent magnet uh, DC machine. So if that motor should fail, there would be then poor clutch engagement, or the clutch engagement would be partial or not at all, or whatever, and it could lead to overheating and physical damage. And then finally, there's a, a possible um, damage or overheating effect just from aggressive driving and that would cause frequent clutch engagement or disengagement. And um, that could lead to overheating and eventual physical damage. Now, one could look at this uh, failure mode plot and say, hey, there could be some other paths that are plausible. Um, that, that, that's fine. Uh, but in general, you're going to find out about these failure modes, uh, at least two of them. If a seal leaks and causes oil starvation, it probably means you're dripping oil on your garage floor. And so there should be some evidence that um, there's oil leaking from the system. Or uh, the car itself will uh, warn you that there's a, a motor failure in the E-diff. Um, and there might be a warning sign that says, hey, stability control is no longer um, available. And so you're... you're the driver is getting a warning. Um, and then finally, of course, what can you do about this? Um, well, the oil fouling problem can be addressed by more frequent uh, oil changes in the differential. Uh, the more aggressive the driving, I would recommend more aggressive oil changes. Not the life of the vehicle, but let's say 25 to 30,000 miles. Uh, change it out. And the unfortunately, if the 12 volt motor fails, you really can't do anything until a car tells you something. Um, and then you should do a unit inspection, this uh, assembly and or, um, you know, see what the failure code is and, and really dig into it. This concludes today's video on the Jaguar E differential. I hope you have a better understanding of the failure modes and what you can do to maintain your unit. And I will be developing a rebuild kit with my friends over at Racing Diffs. I hope you've enjoyed this content, and remember my friends, drive well.